Thank you so, so much, um, everybody, for joining. I can see we already have 172 and going up by the minute uh, attendees. And we have all our, our panelists uh, already on the call. So um, we are so happy uh, to have you on this uh, inaugural uh, PSK's Pharmacy COVID-19 Dialogues, which is something that we want to make um, a, re a regular update uh, from our pharmacists in the field, what they are doing on COVID-19. My name is uh, Dr. Daniela Monene, and I'm the CEO of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya. Uh, and please feel very welcome uh, to this meeting. I would like to introduce you to your moderators for today who will take you through the entire uh, meeting, which is uh, going to be about one and a half hours. So if I could have the next slide, I'd like to introduce the moderators. Our moderators today are Dr. Michael Mungoma. He's a member of PSK. He's also the Dean School of Pharmacy at Mount Kenya University. He's a member of the PSK National Executive Committee. And he's also a member of the PSK COVID-19 Response Task Force. And you're going to hear more about PSK's COVID-19 Response Task Force on this webinar. Karibu sana, Dr. Mike Mungoma. Our second moderator, yeah, our second moderator is uh, Dr. Sylvia Opanga. She's a member of PSK. She's also a senior lecturer at the School of Pharmacy, University of Nairobi. She's also the chair of the Education and Public Health Committee of the PSK COVID-19 Response Task Force. Karibu sana, Dr. Opanga. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. So over to you, moderators. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, participants. I see we have about 217. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. So I will start off with the first part and then Dr. Michael Mungoma will join in. So we have a few ground rules before we start. Um, please ensure that you're muted during the entire course of the webinar so that we don't have any interruptions. When you're asking your questions, please do not use the chat box. Use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your window. This is because it's easier for the panelists to address your questions as we go along. For PSK members, if not already done so, please subscribe on the PPD portal for today's webinar so that you can get your CPD points. This webinar is being recorded and the audio will also be made available on PSK's YouTube page. And next. So um, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Um, Dr. Anthony Kamau is from Kenyatta University um, Teaching and Referral Hospital. He graduated with a B from, from the University of Nairobi in 1997 and therefore start, thereafter started working at Kenyatta National Hospital, after which he moved to the private sector worked for a health maintenance organization, which is HMO Strategies Health as the pharmacist in charge. Later, he went into consulting business, providing innovative solutions to the private health insurance markets and NGO sectors. His passion for pharmacy, however, brought him back to the profession and he re-entered at KU Health Services as the head of pharmacy services. He left KU and is now the head of department or chief pharmacist at the Kenyatta University Teaching and Referral Hospital. Dr. Kamau holds an MSc in Evidence-Based Pharmacotherapy from Aston University, UK, a postgraduate diploma in Global Health Supply Chain Management from Kent University, USA. He's currently finalizing an online MSc in Health Technology Assessment Pricing and Reinvestment from University of Sheffield, UK. Welcome so much to the session, Dr. Kamau. Then I'll go and introduce our second speaker. Professor Ndemo is a fellow of uh, PSK. He has held a number of teaching positions, including senior lecturer at the University of Nairobi. 
prior to getting an appointment at Creighton University and Hampton University in the USA as an associate professor of pharmacy practice. Additionally, he's the recipient of a number of awards, including America Society of Health Systems Pharmacy Research Award, Hampton University Academic Excellence Faculty Award, Clinical Preceptor of the Year for Successfully Running MTM Clinics, and a Fellowship Award as Fellow of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya. Currently, he's the Dean of Pharmacy at the United States, Dean School of Pharmacy at the United States International University, the Clinical Director at True Pharmacare MTM Clinic, the Chairperson of the PSK Policy and Practice Committee, and he's actually leading the PSK COVID-19 Response Task Force. Welcome so much, Professor Ndebe. So those are our speakers for the day. I would like them to go and invite, um, uh, that's just our program for today. We run until 12.30. So you will have um, the session go on until about uh, 12. So we are going to start with um, Dr. Anthony Kamau and then we'll finish off with Professor Demo. Dr. Anthony, welcome to the session. Thank you, Dr. Sylvia. Um, uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, it's a privilege and an honor to make this presentation to all of us. Basically, what we are going to do this morning is to share the role of pharmacists, what, what it is that we've been doing in KUTRRH uh, as far as COVID-19 is concerned. Next slide. Now, before I start off uh, on, the, on the actual presentation, I would just like to state that uh, uh, to date we have had about 369 uh, confirmed cases that were admitted. Uh, we've had about uh, 145 suspected cases. Currently, we have admitted 212 uh, patients in the wards. About half of that are females, and the majority, of course, as you've see, been seeing in the media, are males. So far, recovered from our facility about 135. So for that kind of numbers that we've been receiving, we, of course, had to put in place management and governance structures just to ensure that we manage the situation very well. So a few committees were selected uh, from the board. One of them was the coordination and handling of COVID-19 patients. This basically looks at uh, how patients are received uh, with the ambulances that come from E+. And of course, coordinating with the person releasing ambulances from E+, uh, to the hospital, ensuring that they have the adequate uh, documentation, showing that they are COVID positive, for example, so that they can get admission. Then there is the Nursing and Accommodation Facility Committee, which obviously was looking at uh, accommodation in terms of the wards, accommodation in terms of uh, the, the health workers, uh, those who are in the front line, once they are off duty, uh, they are usually accommodated within the hospital, so just ensuring that they are comfortable. Then efficiency in systems and processing of protocols. This was all around looking at uh, all the systems uh, that uh, are pertain to COVID-19, just ensuring that everything is working well. Patients have their basic necessities, uh, soaps, towels, and so on. Uh, food provision, of course, that was uh, mainly uh, in the restaurant team. Security, very important. Uh, this team really looked at uh, just access through the gates, uh, the security of patients, uh, ensuring that uh, patients are confined in the correct areas and so on. Then of course, there was a referral system coordination. We are getting quite a number of referrals from other facilities, uh, not necessarily through the, the E plus system. So they call directly and we have to coordinate, are they, are they uh, COVID positive or not? And if not, then what circumstances are, are they being brought to the hospital and so on? COVID, uh, commodity security and supply is basically where the pharmacist uh, is playing a strong role and I'll be talking into that in a few minutes. The other committees were the linkages to MOH, which is our parent company, our, our parent ministry. So definitely we need to to hear what it is that they're saying in terms of policy and direction and any guidance. And then the last committee put in place was the policy communication, government, government direction and press communication. Uh, this, this of course is domiciled in the chair's office so that uh, whatever communication is, core is, 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 is coming from the highest office. Next. Next slide. 
So in terms of commodity security, uh, so for those of you who may not be familiar with commodity security, I'll just go by a brief definition. This is the ability to choose basically selection. Uh, and this is basically choosing what drugs are relevant for COVID-19 patients. And I think we'll be seeing that a, a lot more in the, in the guidelines and the protocols that we've developed. And then after you choose which molecules are important to use, then you obtain them through procurement and then you use them as affordable health commodities when and where they are needed. Now, commodity security basically ensures that we have regular supply of essential commodities as part of our health services here at KUTRH. Next. Now, we have two items under commodity security that we have had to ensure are available. One of them was medicines. Now, for medicines, we used what we call the morbidity methods. There are typically three methods you'd, you'd use to estimate the quantities of uh, medicines or other supplies that you need. So what we did was use the morbidity method. Now the morbidity method looks at uh, uh, potential patient attendance data, uh, their morbidity in, in terms of how many are mild, moderate and severe in this case for COVID-19, and then the expected drug use for those morbidities. Now for our case, uh, it was made simple because we didn't have to think of our catchment as Nairobi and begin to think how many people in Nairobi will get sick, how many will attend the outpatient clinics and so on because this disease is more an isolation disease. So that means that once patient, patients come in, they are isolated within the hospital, then all we needed to look at was our bed occupancy. So our estimated bed occupancy that was available for COVID-19 was 300 and an additional 24 ICU beds. So in terms of mobility, and this data was picked from WHO website and uh, other, other publications, uh, we estimated that we'd have about 80% of patients would be mild, 15% would be moderate, and 5% would be severe. And then the treatment protocols we used to estimate are the, drug, uh, the drugs that we need was the, the locally developed uh, management protocols uh, that we developed here. Next. Now, when you make... Uh, um, when you use these methods, you have to have certain assumptions. And so some of the assumptions I mentioned already were the morbidity patterns. So for example, the first one, 80% of 300 beds, we assume that 240 of our beds would be occupied by uncomplicated and mild uh, cases, which roughly turned out to be the case. And then number four, we estimated that at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, we did this exercise in April. So we estimated it would take about three months to reach the peak which clearly has not happened. So we, have, we are having to adjust that assumption. Then we assume that uh, each patient will stay for two weeks and uh, that after the two weeks, there would be another patient taking over. So there would be a, a continuous bed occupancy. And we also assume that all patients would take a standard regimen. So whatever is described in our, in our protocols or guidelines would be used for every patient and every patient would, would get the full uh, uh, you know, whatever is prescribed for mild, every patient will get whatever regimens have been prescribed for mild. Then, of course, the assumption, the other assumption was that medicines would be available. So once we did this exercise, we deducted all this, uh, uh, whatever we had in stock uh, currently from whatever estimates that we, we got. And then we decided to order monthly so that we hedge our, we hedge our risks uh, in case uh, uh, the pandemic doesn't pan out just the way we thought. So we thought, let's do monthly orders. Next. So these are worked example of uh, um, the one medicine that is used for uncomplicated uh, disease. Uh, so antipyretics is what is uh, paracetamol, more specifically, is what is recommended for as one of the uh, antipyretics. So if, if, we, as, if we said one gram TID for 14 days, that works out to 84 tablets per patient and for 240 beds, uh, that, that would be, and then assuming two patients for that same bed per month, uh, that would take us to 40,320 tablets per month. So we did that for, for, for moderate, if, if we are using paracetamol in moderate disease, then we quantified the 15%, what that translates to, and then we added them together to get the amount of tablets that we needed per month. Next. Now, for the severe and critically ill COVID-19 patients, this was a bit more tricky to quantify because typically when patients are in ICU, typically most of these patients go to ICU, 
the, the picture tends to be very mixed and it's very hard to predict even in the guidelines what exactly to use for COVID-19. So what we did was uh, we, we got this resource from the WHO, the table you see down there. What the WHO had done, thankfully for us, was quantify about, um, about 80, 86, 89 medicines uh, uh, for use in uh, critical care for patients who had admitted. Uh, this data, of course, was picked from other areas that had already had this experience, so our job was really half done. Uh, so, as you can see from the table, the quantity indicated there, like for adenosine, number one was 30 adenosine ampules for 40 severely sick patients, which obviously means that not all patients uh, would use adenosine in that uh, ICU scenario or critical care scenario. So that's what we used. We just adjusted the figures to a 24 bed facility, which is what we have. And then uh, we use that now to estimate the, the number of uh, items for critical care that we needed. Again, we, we, we ordered monthly. Next. Then the other mandate that we were given, and this uh, came through the board chair, I was appointed uh, to chair the, the committee for commodity security which included the medicines and the PPEs, which are the personal protective equipment, uh, was to ensure that there is constant supply and accountability. So there are two aspects of that. One is uh, ensuring the supply and the other is accountability so that whatever is, uh, comes into the hospital is well used and for the purposes for which it was intended. So in the committee where I am in, we established the different levels of PPEs and requirements. This we got from the WHO again website, which has been a really good resource, which uh, just tabulates uh, who should be using what PPEs. Uh, and I can tell you, COVID-19 is very, a very emotional time. Uh, everybody thinks that they should have the very best and almost every PPE. Uh, so just managing that emotion was, 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 uh, was quite a challenge at the beginning, but I think people are settling down now. So for staff, every staff in the hospital uh, gets a three-ply surgical mask per day. And this is issued per department, per section, or per office, depending on, on the structure. Uh, that's, again, to prevent staff-to-staff -staff, uh, transmission um, and just to keep the staff safe. Then for patients, we supply one three-ply surgical mask uh, on alternate days. Then for frontline workers, those are doctors, nurses, public health uh, officers, we give the full PPEs. Now full PPE, uh, for those who may not have seen what one looks like, it means having a coverall, which is a, a, a gown that covers from the tip of the head to the, to the ankles. Then an N95 mask, which is a very good mask for, uh, for prevention of viral. Uh, it sort of has a filter preventing viral, uh, viral particles from coming in through the air. Then the three ply surgical masks, the goggles, they have to have goggles which are mist resistant so that when they go into the COVID-19 patients or COVID-19 areas like in ICU, they, they don't mist over and they have to, because it's very difficult to, to clean out the goggles when you're already inside. Then uh, face shields, um, uh, face shields look like the ones that are used by, by riot police sometimes, but yeah. Then shoe covers, disposable aprons, gynecological gloves. We, we, we chose gynecological gloves, although literature recommends otherwise, because they, they tend to reach up to the ankle. So uh, better protection against uh, fluids and fluid spillage and, and all that, and gumboots. Now, you note that all these things except the gumboots are disposable. So, so typically, once they're single use, once the clinician or the nurses or the public health officers use this, they're disposed of. Next. Then uh, there are those uh, sections in the hospital that require minimal, minimum PPE, uh, which is basically a scaled down version of what I've just talked about. Uh, basically, the people who are screening or triaging, medic, uh, the medical personnel who are triaging at the gate as people come in, uh, who to take the temperature and who dispense um, the sanitizer. Those ones need minimal PPE, maybe a goggles or a face shield or a three-ply mask or and a disposable surgical gown. So again, we had to quantify for that based on need. Uh, all the way to A&D staff who, who, who are not sure whether the patients they see are COVID positive or not. So because of that fear and uncertainty, definitely uh, we have to provide some level of safety 
Stuff in quarantine areas, quarantine, you know, is different from isolation. Quarantine is uh, those patients who are suspect. Uh, either they came in because of a travel history from countries where there was COVID infection or they've had close contact with uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, patients, then they're put in quarantine. So again, those staff don't need the full PPE. They just need a scaled down PPE, uh, but still enough to protect them in case one of the suspects is, is turns out positive. Morgue workers, of course, handling bodies. Uh, again, we don't know, even if a patient or a person died of a road traffic accident, we don't know whether they had COVID-19. So again, we have to provide some level of PPE. So again, we have to quantify for that. Uh, surgeries, those are, uh, you know, doctors doing surgeries, again, when they're not sure about the patient status, they may have, uh, they may have come for a cesarean section or other type of surgery but may have maybe asymptomatic for COVID-19. So again, we have to factor that in. Uh, oncology have had a good arrangement where they just used N95 mask and recycle. This is uh, something that had been um, tried out, especially in India. So just use one surgical mask uh, and then uh, put it aside on day one, and then put it aside to dry, and then uh, use the next surgical mask. So they get like five. So the one they used on day one, they can reuse again on day five. And so that cycle continues for the rest of the month. So typically they get about five. So that really has helped uh, in terms of uh, use of N95 masks, which tend to be very expensive and rare to come by. Now, what we did was estimate monthly consumption uh, for these commodities. And then uh, of course have a buffer stock. Uh, uh, now, of course, with the resurgence in infections, we, we are having to re-evaluate our assumptions again so that we ensure that uh, we beef up the monthly consumptions and the buffer stocks. Next. The second thing we've done as pharmacists in uh, the hospital is uh, had input in case management guidelines. Uh, this basically is uh, the treatment, if you, if you like, the treatment protocols or the treatment guidelines uh, for COVID-19 patients. So these were developed by consultants in the hospital. And then uh, we had general inputs as pharmacists uh, when they were circulated. And then as the Secretary of the Pharmacy and the Medicines and Therapeutics Committee, uh, I was able to convene the committee and uh, uh, guide the clinicians on uh, how best they should be adapted within the hospital. So they were ratified at a meeting, a full meeting of the Medicines and Therapeutics Committee. And then um, they were signed off by the Director of Clinical Services and the CEO. Then what followed is that we put together an internal webinar for the dissemination of these uh, case management guidelines so that every clinician, every MO, especially the MOs because they are the frontline workers, are more acquainted and able to use them well. Next. The third role that we've had uh, under COVID-19 as pharmacists is to, to do what we call medicines use review. And uh, medicines use review is uh, basically a, a, an ongoing systematic criteria-based program of medicine evaluations that help ensure appropriate medicines use. So what this program or review does is to ensure that uh, pharmace pharmaceutical therapy meets current standards of care. So in our case, uh, it's, it's to see that where they're in line, whatever drugs are being used or being ordered from the pharmacy are in line with the treatment protocols or guidelines. And then two, to establish trends in medication use. Uh, are, there, are there higher use of antibiotics or, or lower use of this or that drug? Uh, which, which, which may indicate there's a problem of either not following guidelines or the, 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 the clinical picture may, may be different from what we, we suspect. And then three is to identify specific medicine use problems that require further uh, evaluation. That is the purpose of a medicine use review. Next. So we've conducted two of these uh, in the hospital. The first one we did um, early April and uh, we were able to disseminate that in uh, some collaborative work we did with um, Kenyatta National Hospital and the uh, University of Nairobi. And uh, uh, Dr. Irene was uh, very instrumental in bringing that together. So we were able to make our presentation, KNH did a presentation and uh, University of Nairobi as well, very, very informative. And then we also had, uh, we also did a second uh, MUR um, sometime later with a different uh, different data set. 
and we disseminated these, both of these actually, we combined both of these and disseminated uh, the same in an internal webinar. Uh, the same time we're disseminating the, the protocols, we also disseminated the, the MUR results as well. Next. So these are just, uh, we can't go into the details, but uh, these are just uh, some of the summary findings. Now, this is the age distribution. Sorry, the, the, the chart is not, um, has no title, but this is really the age distribution of the patients that we've seen in the MUR1 that we did, which had 79 uh, patients, and MUR2, which had 113 uh, patient data sets. So you can see that majority of our patients are between 30 and 59. And then next is the next highest group is the 15 to 29 age group. Next. Uh, this one speaks more into the use of drugs uh, by percentage of patients. Sorry, the first, uh, the first bar chart, the, first, the longest one, the longest is, uh, should indicate mouthwash. So the highest use of uh, medicines we have seen is mouthwash with 84% of patients in the first uh, uh, MUR. The second MUR had a lower use of the same. Then cetirizine is also high use. The third uh, they are missing is paracetamol, uh, which then is, is a, is a, is a painkiller on antipyretic. Then the fourth is uh, we come now to the antibiotics. Azithromycin tends to have high use compared to any other antibiotic so far. And then the fourth that is also missing is multivitamin. Uh, so this has increased from the 8% in the first uh, uh, MUR that we did to about 18%. And then uh, finally, amoxiclub. Of course, there are many other drugs that have been used, but we just picked uh, what would you would you call the top five or six uh, uh, drugs by use in, by patients. Next. Uh, so I just wanted to just compare this with the, with the protocol. And so I placed them side by side. So you can see that for antipyretics in mild disease, the protocols uh, had, have indicated that we use uh, 500 milligrams uh, uh, paracetamol. So you can see paracetamol is there. That we avoid NSAIDs. So you can see in the top six or seven drugs, the NSAIDs are not being used. Although in, in other data that we also analyzed, we saw that there are a bit of use of NSAIDs. Uh, well, literature initially suggested that NSAIDs should not be used for COVID-19, but um, I think the literature coming out says it, it still can be used with no adverse if effects. Antihistamines, you can see, is, is recommended in the protocols. It's also being used by the clinicians. Multivitamins, recommended, also being used, mouthwash. So clearly, the clinicians have been uh, uh, complying to the protocol. Now, for inhaler bronchodilators, this is for consideration in case a patient needs. Uh, well, clearly, not many patients uh, need bronchodilators. Next. Antibiotic use. Now, antibiotics is an interesting uh, subject because it's estimated that about 8% of patients uh, have co-infections or super-infections with uh, either bacteria or, um, or fungus. So typically, we would expect very minimal use of antibiotic. Now, our protocol for mild pneumonia would uh, say, suggest that we, we need to use amoxicillin plus one gram plus uh, azithromycin or clarithromycin. In our case, we have azithromycin. Uh, however, we see that uh, in both uh, studies that we did, the first and second, we see both. We, we see high number of, especially azithromycin, being, being used alone. So probably that's a point of intervention for pharmacists. And I think in the webinar that we had, that was highlighted. Next. Next. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Hello, Peter, are you there to change the slides?
Let me just try and get hold of Peter. Sorry for that. Okay, sorry for that, okay. Keith. Sorry for that, Daktari. Um, I'll just share the slides from here. Okay. So, is, Peter is back. Sorry. Okay. So, next slide. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, the, the fourth role that we've had and we've... Uh, is, is advisory on investigation on new therapies. Uh, I know quite a number of us have been attending webinars and we've, or we've come across this literature. So in our protocols, uh, the new therapies have been, are to be used on availability or consultant discretion, and then of course the necessary authorization. So these are the ones that have been listed in our protocols. Uh, I just singled out hydroxychloroquine because it is re re readily available uh, locally and uh, cheap for use. However, these others have been uh, uh, potential candidates for use. Next. So what we did uh, with regard to hydroxychloroquine is that we, we sought uh, advice from the Pharmacy and Poisons Board uh, because we know that this drug is not indicated for use in COVID-19 or, or rather for viral infections. Uh, its mainstay is more in the uh, use of uh, malaria and um, the autoimmune diseases. So PPB advised that it would be good to seek uh, authorization because uh, this drug then would be considered an investigational, an investigational drug, uh, which we did through the CEO as the pharmacists. Then uh, we got PPB approval for use, uh, however, with certain conditions, which uh, I'll mention. Uh, those conditions are, are in line with the WHO MURI mechanism, which is really the monitored emergency use of unregistered interventions framework that tries to safeguard patients uh, under pandemic uh, situations, especially when uh, uh, investigational drugs are being tried out so that patient safety is, is topmost. Now, uh, of course, that brought us in conflict with clinicians because uh, we realized that clinicians, when they use off-label drugs, usually on one or two patients, they do it as a personal initiative. But now we are talking of a pandemic. We are talking of um, potential mass use of, of these drugs. So um, given the conditions that are on the next uh, page, you probably understand why the conflict came about next. So for, for us to use uh, hydroxychloroquine, the board has uh, given direction that all patients or legal guardians should sign informed consent approved by uh, the Institutional Regu uh, Research Board, or um, if you like, the Ethics and Research Committee, uh, because obviously these drugs have been considered investigational, they have been considered more of a, a trial, uh, even though it's not a full clinical trial, uh, it still needs to to, to be able to collect data enough to, to, to see what the outcomes are and yet safeguard uh, patients in, the, in, the, in, in this whole scenario. So of course, patients have the option of opting out or refusing this investigation or treatment. The document and report all ADRs weekly and uh, fatal cases in 48 hours. That's also a requirement of, um, for investigation on new drugs. Then uh, we were required to also give a summary of patient outcomes and report them weekly. That's what we would say clinical outcomes like virological progression, radiological progression if there was pneumonia uh, and so on and so forth. Then we had to give an accountability of the products that we are using, how many did we use, how many are in stock, how many, uh, you know. So there had to be an accountability of all the drugs that we are using uh, for, for treatment of COVID-19. Then of course, it, all this off-label use uh, need, needed to be documented in the patient's registry. Next. The fifth thing that we have uh, engaged in at, uh, at the hospital is there is a WHO intends to carry out a, a study, a clinical trial, uh, and this was going to be one of the centers. It's a multi-center trial. 
So one of the pharmacists, uh, myself, I'm a site investigator. Another pharmacist uh, will, will be, and the farm tech will be site staff, who will be ensuring availability, uh, proper storage and accountability for medicines. The proposed medicines are hydroxychloroquine uh, arm, that would be one arm, and then remdesivir, the antiviral, as another arm, and lopinavir, ritonavir, the antiretroviral, as another arm. I believe yesterday or the day before, uh, WHO indicated that it will not be using hydroxychloroquine uh, anymore in the, in the treatment arms because of the safety data that uh, has recently come out. So for us, we are expecting this trial to start anytime soon. Uh, so we're just um, um, waiting the go ahead from the board. Next. The other role that we've played is the critical appraisal of literature. What we realize is that there are lots of publications are being done right now. And unfortunately, they are being done on small courts of patients. Uh, then most of them are case studies or case controls or observational trials. And uh, when you look at the hierarchy of evidence in terms of their strength, they tend to be not as strong. And we've, we've, we found ourselves having to guide sometimes the, when we're involved in clinical uh, discussions, uh, whether these trials results really should, we should use them to make a decision about what, what we should or should not do in the hospital. So most of the articles, if you've been looking through the journals are preprint, what we call preprint versions. So they are not peer reviewed. So they tend to be very raw. They also have no editorial review. So again, lots of data are missing. So it's very hard also sometimes to make a, a definitive conclusion about uh, what the, the authors conclude to be uh, the outcome of the study and whether it should be applied in a hospital or not. So as I said, uh, we needed to guide clinicians to avoid the negative attitude, especially to hydroxychloroquine, which came out very early. Uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the course of the month, the last one month. Next. Now, one of the studies that we guided was this one by Barbosa et al, 2020, which was looking at uh, uh, the outcomes of hydroxychloroquine in hospitalized patients with COVID-19, what they called a quasi-randomized comparative study. The conclusion was from that study was that hydroxychloroquine administered to the hospitalized SARS-CoV-2 positive population was associated with an increased need for escalation of respiratory support. And the other conclusion was that there was no benefit of hydroxychloroquine on mortality, lymphopenia, or neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio improvement. Now, next slide. Now, the critical appraisal on this uh, study was, was about two to three pages, but really just looking at why, why should we not take that uh, conclusion at face value, even though the study authors had indicated that more work needed to be done? I think our concern came about because when this article was circulated, especially among the ICU team, uh, it, it, the, the conclusions were already drawn that this drug does not work and we should not uh, use it. So what we did was just look at the, uh, critically appraise the literature in terms of just looking at the strength of the study, um, where does it lie in terms of uh, compared to if an RCT had been done? And uh, what were the, the potential confounders? Uh, confounders are, are those aspects of a study that could also cause an effect on the treatment outcome. Uh, so had they been controlled for in, in these studies, which when you look at the type of study we are talking about, retrospective, comparative, that tends to be minimal. Uh, of course, there was no masking, no randomization. Randomization it gives an equal chance for patients to enter uh, either the treatment or the control arm, which didn't happen. There was no masking of treatment to patients, investigators or analysts. So investigators could treat the patients differently, knowing that this was, this, they were going to you know, uh, give uh, data about uh, studies and so on. So there are many biases that are expected in these types of uh, studies. There was no specific dosage for patients in the study, so it's hard to tell what, what dosage was a problem. Was dosage a problem, and could that be the potential problem that may cause negative results? The small study of number of patients was also a, a problem because you know the, the power of the study then, uh, is it sufficient to say that the results uh, apply to a, a huge, a, a larger number of patients, for example? So, the conclusion was that this study had no or low internal validity. 
which basically means that we cannot make an inference of causality, uh, specifically that hydro hydroxychloroquine caused there to be um, a worsening of, of symptoms. So that's what we shared, and uh, that was appreciated by the clinicians. And uh, I think that that engagement helped uh, help, um, the clinicians be able to also think a bit differently about the drugs that uh, potentially can be used and about the studies and how best to interpret them. Next. So this study, when uh, it was a bit tough to categorize in the hierarchy of evidence, this is a hierarchy of evidence uh, triangle. Now the top shows the, the best type of studies you'd want to base your clinical judgment or decisions on. And uh, as far as COVID-19 is concerned, there's very little to go by. So we are definitely having to depend a lot on published uh, literature. So the better the quality of that literature, then the better the, the quality decisions that are made in terms of uh, interventions for COVID-19 patients. So for this, uh, this intervention, would I'd put it at uh, evidence level three, and even at level three, it would be number three. So potentially have it through. So again, we'd need to decide once you read a, read a paper or on, on if it's a quasi-experimental design, whether you can use that to, to, to base your treatment uh, uh, decisions on. Next. Dr. Kamau, if you could just speed up a bit. Thank you. Okay. Then the systematic review was uh, another thing that we did uh, during the dissemination of the, of the guidelines. We, we did a systematic review. We just went through a Shama, this, this article by Shama P. et al. Uh, that was talking about virological and clinical cure for COVID-19 patients. So basically what a systematic review does is take a lot of studies that uh, are looking at the same thing and then putting them together and seeing whether the overall effect is, what the overall effect is. If two studies uh, say it's negative and two studies say positive, then what is the overall outcome? So that's what we shared. Next. Uh, so systematic reviews and meta-analysis tend to be at the top of the pyramid in terms of quality of evidence and, re and less risk of bias. Next. So this study showed uh, the 278 articles were, were gotten from different databases. Uh, seven articles were included in the systematic reviews. Four of them were preprint versions. Three were included in the meta-analysis. Next. So what this study showed was that hydroxychloroquine only showed benefit in terms of radiological progression. So patients did not progress radiologically compared to those who were not taking hydroxychloroquine, but on every other thing, uh, in every other clinical outcome didn't do very well. Then uh, there was some benefit in time to body temperature normalization. That's the time it took to, for the body temperature to normalize and the number of days that the cough took to subside, there was some benefit. Uh, both control and uh, hydroxychloroquine arms had comparable side effects. Then there was the use of both hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. The benefits were uncertain based on the systematic review um, data. And definitely the overall uh, outcome of the study was that more clinical studies need, were needed for definitive conclusion. I think for us, it was basically just to show the the importance of uh, looking at systematic reviews as a potential source of information uh, for clinical decision making. FIP, the holding statement also upholds this. Uh, in their statement on 24th April 2020, they've indicated that uh, this drug has not demonstrated uh, clear effectiveness. Next. The other role we've played is uh, in involvement in COVID-19 committees. As I said, we have uh, in, we have been involved in COVID uh, Commodity Security Committee. Um, we are also involved in the COVID Champions uh, meetings, which happen initially were happening daily, uh, which brings all together all the stakeholders that have a play in the in in anything to do with COVID uh, nineteen patients and and just bring out whatever issues that are there. Right now, we meet about twice a week uh, because obviously things things have settled a bit. Then uh, we also have the Infection Control Committee, which meets weekly. There's a pharmacist who chairs one of the subcommittees. 
the Antimicrobial Resistance Committee. Next. The other role we have done is to guide on the safety of pharmacy staff. Obviously, when the COVID-19 came out or started, uh, the first case was detected, then there were, of course the fears and they were real about are we going to infect our staff and what are we going to do? So there's some very good guidance from the CDC website that we circulated to staff and the FIP. And I've just uh, highlighted those uh, on this slide. Uh, safe to say that we implemented a few of them. Uh, one of which was uh, we moved our A&E pharmacy then to the main pharmacy because our main pharmacy had not uh, officially been opened, but had a better uh, protective um, um, windows for our staff as we repaired the A and D pharmacy. Next. So for staff, we provided them with masks. Uh, I said we moved up uh, to main pharmacy. Then uh, one of the things we did is work with um, uh, the health records to ensure that whatever uh, treatment sheets that are coming out are safe. We tried a few things here and there like Google Docs, which didn't quite work. But eventually, we, we settled on using, using a tablet uh, to collect patient information in the, in the patients and then send to the person in the clean area. Clean area is outside of the COVID area, then where those, those documents are worked on and brought to the pharmacy. Then, of course, there's regular cleaning of customer surface uh, area with disinfectants. Next. So that is a picture of our main pharmacy. You can see the window partitions and the distance between the, where the patient on the outside would be. This is the inside of the pharmacy. So yeah, that distance was good. And also the glass partition provided uh, a, a sense of safety uh, even for the staff. Next. Those are the wonderful team that I work with. Uh, that's me on the extreme left. There's uh, Dr. Boro, there's Dr. Anita, Dr. Eric, Dr. Kimani. Evelyn, Marcy, and Peter. Next. The only addition there is Dr. Maina, the extreme uh, right. These are very solid team, and I think we would not have done this without every one of their inputs. Next. That is our pharmacy stores where we put our COVID-19 uh, supplies and other supplies, and that's Dr. Buru, who manages that uh, facility for us. Next. Thank you for listening. Thank you That's so me. much, uh, Dr. Kamau, for that presentation. That was a very, very rich presentation. It, uh, it has a lot there for, for the participants to learn. Um, I think you're doing a very good job at your facility. Uh, just to remind participants, again, make sure you register with the, at the PPB portal in order for you to get your CPD points. I'm also getting text and getting uh, information along the chat that there are even nurses and other cadres here. I'm sure we, are, we can arrange for <clears throat> your CPD point allocation for your specific bodies. Uh, we'll provide an email later on so that you can uh, uh, send us your details in order for us to facilitate that. In order to just to keep time, at this point I'm going to introduce again Professor Ndemo to make his presentation. And then after that, we are going to address the questions that are being raised. Keep sending your questions through the Q&A at the bottom of uh, at the bottom panel there on your screen. So just keep typing in your questions. And at the end of this presentation, we should be able to take the questions for both presenters. Thank you. Professor Ndemo. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Michael Mungoma. I, I also wish to thank, um, please feel welcome to this webinar. For everybody I can see, um, very impressed the, the numbers are still creeping up to almost 400. I, I wish to thank all the, uh, the moderators, including Dr. Opanga, who is now a naturalized uh, Ugandan. And uh, also, I do wish to thank uh, Dr. Anton Kamau for that well-presented, very insightful, actual presentation. Um, my task here today as a chair or the chairman of the PSK COVID response task force 
is to give you a little bit of uh, background, how this was formed and what our mandate is and where we're going with this. So um, this task force actually was uh, formed uh, almost like uh, well over a month, almost close to two months ago. And uh, PSK, through the guidance of the CEO, Dr. Daniela, and I believe there was a doctor who was again, there was uh, Dr. Tebe and the others, we kind of came together and decided to form a response team. Because after realizing, with all the briefs we were getting, there was uh, the farm cells were not visible. But very briefly, we came together and uh, kind of articulated the, our, our potential contribution to the fight against this pandemic. We came up with, uh, with actually six thematic areas. As you can see, we have uh, six committees. There is the training and public health education, it's a case management, infection prevention and control, it's a supply chain management, alternative and complementary medicine, risk communication and public relations, and then lastly, resource mobilizations. But uh, before I move from this slide, you can actually see that this task force is not working without, but actually feeding into other initiatives. One, of course, on the extreme right, you can see we work closely with the KHF, that's the Kenya Healthcare Federation. And I believe the CEO, PSK CEO, Dr. Um, Nene is involved. That fits into CAPSER and obviously into the National Emergency Response Committee. But we also have representations in the MOH without going into details. So if I could, uh, as I said, my job is to actually introduce uh, the, this task force uh, try and delineate what uh, our expected outcomes are and how you could come in as a fraternity to help uh, this task force so that we can actually have a lasting impact on the management. So can I have the next slide, please? Now, this is our, the expected outcome from this webinar. It's important to understand, otherwise will be work in futility. First and foremost, we, we really need to see how we can utilize the more than 5,000 outlets, pharmacy practice services in the country, of course, including the hospitals, et cetera. But we do know that we have more than 5,000 outlets and uh, with a new major paradigm shift in pharmacy where the pharmacy is, is playing a very important role, including the farm techs in actually in the, in the community service and on the public sector. That is the so-called population health. So we really need to see how we can make use of, uh, of, uh, of these outlets. And then of course, there is a, the issue of the availability of essential health products and technologies, which were heavily presented uh, by Dr. Kamal, you do realize that the health product and technologies are under pharmacy and persons board. And so we really, it's, it's our responsibility as, as pharmacists or pharmacy uh, personnel to take care of that. Then there is, of course, there is the availability of the clinical evidence. Uh, Dr. Kamal presented it pretty well. You can actually see with all those studies and meta-analysis is uh, we, we are in an era where we actually use evidence-based medicine to, to guide our treatment. So it's important instead of jumping, it's a pandemic. So everybody's doing everything and anything to, 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 to control the, uh, the pandemic. But we truly need have to work also carefully that we, we actually use evidence uh, clinical evidence, and uh, you could see there are levels of evidence. You saw that in the in the pyramid. So and uh, so, it's really, we we have a committee that are that addresses the new investigational therapies. Then, of course, we you have been seeing a lot of misinformation in the public. It's important. We actually felt as a profession 
it's our responsibility to to clarify because I remember Dr. Mungoma, I don't know what he's using, he told me you can use black tea. Hopefully uh, uh, that has been, uh, of course, disputed. Uh, and there are so many other claims. So it's important that we, we take care of that. We have a committee that looks into that. We'll be talking about that later. But again, there is also the uh, availability of resources, both human and financial, uh, to support all these activities. And then finally, we also need to be of value addition to other healthcare activities that are ongoing from, through the Minister of, uh, of Health. So in, in, in summary, we'd like you to reflect upon what I've just said and see how you can help us in. Unfortunately, we're unable to meet uh, as, a, as a society this year because of the COVID. But it's important that we, we, be, we actually take a proactive role and, and then support these committees. So in the next couple of slides, my presentation is gonna be very short. I'm gonna show you the various committees and, the, uh, and their responsibilities. The first one is a training on public health education. The chair is none other than uh, the naturalized Ugandan, Dr. Sylvia Panga. Uh, the rest of the members of, of course, Michael Mungoma, also moderator today, there's Masi Maina, Jaguga, uh, David Odiambo, Sultani, Elizabeth Ogaja, Nadia uh, Rizvi. All those are the members, and they've actually been meeting every week. Uh, to, uh, they were actually given, uh, rather they came up with uh, very specific uh, outputs uh, which translate into very specific activity and they have been reporting to the main committee that meets every Friday uh, at uh, one o'clock. So you can actually see the objectives, the broad objectives for this training and public health education committee is to provide continuous professional development of uh, development education to pharmacies on COVID-19. So uh, number two, is also to provide the COVID-19 public health education to the members of the public. And also finally, is also to, they are carrying out, uh, I think through Dr. Kahiga from uh, KU, they, they, they are doing, um, they are assessing the, the CAP, the knowledge, attitude and practices on COVID-19 among its professionals and the public. Usually the, the findings will of course help in, inform us as what sort of messages we will, we will be devising for the public. So you can see the stakeholders in this case. If you look at all the membership, you can see universities uh, like Dr. Mungoma, Dr. Panga from universities, PSK, uh, PSK, KPA, Kenya Pharmaceutical Association, MSH, MOH, and KEFSA. All those are the active stakeholders. They have been very instrumental. So. Uh, with that, I think I'm done with the training and public health education committee. Now, let's talk about the case management and uh, IPC. This one is, uh, is, uh, is currently headed by Dr. Yakub Hamid. There was a, pre a brief stint by Dr. Benson and Juguna from MTRH, but he's there, he's supporting us uh, from behind the scenes. Um, the stakeholders in this case, obviously, Camry is one of them, HOPAC, the universities, and MOH. What is, up, what is missing in the objectives? The very first one, which I thought was extremely important, is an oversight. We are developing um, the pharmaceutical care and the therapeutic management of COVID patients. Pharmaceutical care and therapeutic management of this is not necessarily a parallel guidance to you listen to Dr. Anthony Kamau present, they have protocols. This one is a value addition to the medical management. In other words, um, what is lacking even as a profession is, the, is our job is to ensure the safe and effective use of medications, but of course, there's a third element of cost effectiveness. 
But in this case, we actually felt, irrespective of what they're using, our job is to ensure that we have proper, adequate, and adequate uh, monitoring parameters for e effectiveness and safety. That will uh, that is being prepared at the moment. I'm one of uh, uh, the team members in that case. So that one will come out and uh, I think is gonna be part of the national guidelines in general, irrespective of uh, whether they are, we are dealing with a COVID patient, but anybody taking any medications should be carefully monitored. So number two, the, the objective for uh, the manage, for the case management team is to regularly update PSK members and other HCPs on incredible drug information for managing COVID-19. You can actually see that is already undertaken by the Dr. Kamau and the group to evaluate scientific literature on investigation medicines using COVID-19 and general treatment protocols. That, of course, is, again, is not in isolation, it's in, 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 uh, also in, uh, in conjunction or in, uh, in tandem, or they have to be in tandem with other clinical teams. In this case, you have to be seeing the pharmacists as clinicians. Clinicians are not necessarily called physicians. Uh, and to enhance safe and the safe use of medicines in COVID-19 patients and enhance patient outcomes. So again, uh, without short of giving a lecture on this one, it was hoped in the US that by 2015, of course they have gone past that date, that pharmacy will be responsible for drug therapy outcomes. In this case, we're not just in merely giving uh, good information to physician to be the ultimate physician makers, but you have a direct patient care. And therefore, that's how we are coming in. Our, our responsibilities or our role is actually not supplemented, but complementary because there have been all these gaps over these years. So can I have the next one? That's for the case management and IPC. Let me have the next. Coming, the supply chain management, this has also been, again, uh, uh, this been ably presented by Dr. Kamal. Remember, remember when, when uh, personally, when I, I, my passion is of course is pharmaceutical care. For a pharmacist, this is for because they're 385. That those young pharmacists may probably get this message. For, for, uh, for us as. Uh, as pharmaceutical care practitioners, of course, as pharmacists providing clinical care, is essentially there are four drug related needs that must be met before you get a desirable outcome. That means any drug therapy must be the most appropriate, the most, the, the, the regimen is the most effective, the safest possible, and, the, and that the patient is able and willing uh, to follow or to adhere to the, uh, to, uh, to the regimens. By this, I mean, if you mess up with one of the arms that I mentioned, those four drug related needs, including compliance, the supply chain. So this is not something, it may not see, appear to be clinical. It is clinical in the sense that without a timely and a proper supply chain, the patient may actually not comply because the drug product is not available uh, or it's expensive. It's available, but not expensive. So I'm saying supply chain is, is crucial, but unfortunately, the profession also have been also preoccupied with the heavy product matters, but I believe things are closing in, which is a good thing. So you can see here, the, the, the chair is uh, Dr. James Menda. And of course, there's a whole list of uh, members who have, uh, including even the CEO, who actually uh, contributing to, to, to the, I mean, in, in the deliberation of this, uh, of this committee. So um, the stakeholders, you can actually see there's MEDS, it's CAPI, CAMSA, National Quality Control, uh, MOH and KPA. So the objectives, so that I'm, uh, I'm done with them, is uh, we, one of the objectives of course is to provide adequate quality PPEs, and you, are, uh, and you realize what the PPEs are, sanitizers, EMS, and, and again, the penetration, access is important. That means 
uh, as is stated here, then they should be available and even the last mile in health facilities, public and private. Now, there's an issue of initially when I first bought my, my, uh, my mask, actually I thought it, I, bought, I bought it for 500 shillings and the, the N95 was, I think it was 1600. It was a, a very exploitative prices actually. But then is to advocate for subsidized masks and also is to promote accountability and availability of essential commodities. It's very likely to happen when, when commodities are in short supply. Now, the, there was also the issue of us forming as an advocacy group to fast track importation of uh, important items and, uh, and then of course, maybe go for some waivers in terms of taxes. So those are the objectives for the supply chain management. They have been doing a good job and uh, although I missed last meeting, uh, I'm sure the, they're still doing a good job. That is the, the third thematic area in our, in our thrust for the supply chain management. Could I have the next slide? Now, we, there is this one that, uh, of course, most of us shun, the complementary alternative mission. The title itself is very discriminatory as I see the, those alternative and and complimented did not work. This is a, I, some of us actually believe there, is, there are some genuine uh, Mitch Shambas that work, but we have a committee that is headed by uh, Dr. Elizabeth Ogaja from Cabrac University. We have uh, people from, uh, I'm sorry, professionals from Jennifer Orwa, and of course, most of you know, Professor Julius Mwangi, and uh, all the others, there are those who have been actually, there's Dr. Kefa Pusiri, who's actually a doctor, I think is in Mitshamba too. So all this, including Dr. Ithi Wakori, all this, I team that were put together and uh, their objective is to develop a guidance on clinical trials for traditional medicine. You, of course, you've been following the news, the Madagascar Kiwa, quote unquote, there are all these issues. And the manager really doesn't know where the truth lies. And uh, personally, I'm also even dealing some, uh, some uh, tablets for COVID from Kilifi, and then another one from Kisumu. And uh, we really are, uh, the, the, pub, the public really expect us to give guidance on this and the use of complementary alternative medicines. And uh, obviously, so, some of the objectives, they may not be attainable or achievable immediately. The establish the register of alternative medicines is important. Develop guidance on use of herbal medicine for COVID-19 and the factors on various herbal uh, uh, COVID. Not everybody, that is, usually we do have a lot of quacks around too. And as much as we also have some genuine herbal uh, medical uh, medicine practitioners. But the representation here, of course, is the institutions, is Camry, universities, and MOH. So with that, this is just a brief to tell you what's going on and you can always see where you can actually fit in and contribute. So let's move on to the next slide. Then we have the risk communication and public relations. Uh, you do realize I'm the chair of this committee and uh, the, we have our able CEO actually contributed quite a bit We've been meeting regularly, I think, except for one day, people, I don't know whether they chickened out, but uh, for us, we've been going on and on and on, and uh, I think we're making headway. We, the, our objective for this committee is, in fact, essentially, it's important. We need to be visible because we're, we're, we're MIAs. Farmers are mostly in MIAs. So even the list that Dr. Kamau listed, the, the frontline workers, I don't see the name of a pharmacist there. So maybe, it's, maybe we are not, but I, I still believe you can have a, a medicine, which is the most common use intervention in healthcare, and the pharmacist is nowhere to be seen. I think, I still feel is unfair, 
but we really need to speak up. You just have to fight for your space. Now, coming to the objectives, we need, the, we hope to have effective communication to pharmacists first, other healthcare professionals and the public on COVID case management, the uh, information also on, on the same, and also on the on medicines used for COVID-19. Now, also, we, we have actually been, actually been engaged uh, in, uh, in liaising with the Ministry of Health. We have, we, have had to, we have actually even approached the PS, and some of us have even seen the, uh, um, uh, the minister. So really, and we've been engaged, we've been involved. If you remember the first diagram that I showed, when uh, we, we are liaising with the Kenya Health Federation and all these other committees, we are there. And, um, and now, as, as you can see, we are, lies, we are brought in the Kenyatta Teaching Referral Hospital. We are actually, we, we are liaising. Our job is, uh, is to make sure that uh, our presence is felt and that we're truly communicating. So can I have the next slide? Next slide. Now we, we, we said, uh, obviously all those beautiful objectives will not be possible without the, both the human, human and the financial resources. So we have the, the resource mobilization that is uh, led by uh, our president, uh, Dr. Louis Machago. And uh, essentially the mandate is to develop a budget uh, for these task force activities identify sources of funds and other resources, and also mobilize research from members and stakeholders. You can, um, and the members, I can see, <laughs> I can only see Dr. Daniela Mnena as being one of them. I thought there was a, it was a bigger membership than that. But anyway, essentially the, the PSK uh, COVID-19 response task force is a PSK initiative. So essentially everything here, yeah, it runs through all these committees, including resource mobilizations. We, we have, and in fact, the president has made an appeal and uh, the response has been very good. And that's some of the, the appeal that I've been making on my uh, concluding remarks. So it's important and unfortunate, there was no meeting this year. Remember the, um, the PSK membership is voluntary, as it is right now. Even though uh, hopefully very soon it will, you just have to be belong. It's really unfortunate that most of us don't realize you're not a full professional until you belong to a, an organization who upholds ethical principles. All we are, we are just registered. Our name is in the register and then you, we, some of us just go and dance around and do our own things. But I, I was just thinking, we have had support from you, and I'm very glad that you showed up. And, uh, and for me, I've been faithfully attending the meetings in Mombasa, uh, but uh, we truly need support. But again, in my concluding remarks, I want to readdress that again. Can I have the next slide? Next slide. Now, in, um, so far, I have uh, I given you a little background on how we started this, how the PSK initiated this, uh, I mean, started this initiative. And uh, we, we actually sat down, uh, identified the thematic areas that, uh, that informed that uh, the various uh, committees were set with a very clear mandate. Uh, also, we have, uh, we have approached the ministry and all these other stakeholders. So what we're trying to do is uh, for sure, for us to be visible and uh, leave a legacy during this pandemic, we really need your support. So number one, please uh, try and uh, send your suggestions and thought contribution to these six thematic areas that I presented. Also, you need to alert the task force on emerging issues to do with medicines, use, access, or safety related to COVID-19. And finally, um, the, I believe, I still remember very strongly, 
in my management uh, training, you can never accomplish anything and until you identify what the problem what the problem is who's going to do it when it's going to do it uh, and who's going to pay for it so we don't expect miracles if there's no financial support we have uh, um, some of us are okay big talkers but we truly truly need your support and you can actually see your contribution can be sent to PSK pay bill account and uh, I really appreciate But I'm also, I'm very impressed. The turnout was very good, very encouraged. And uh, with this, uh, uh, the, for the moderators, I think back to you and I thank for the audience. I just hope you will get your, uh, you will give us our support. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Nemo, for that insight on the COVID-19 task force that uh, PSK has put together. Just to mention again that uh, the task force also includes um, members from the Kenya Pharmaceutical Association, KPA, and we've also had meetings together with uh, Peter, Peter Mugere, who has been an active member of that task force. Again, we just want to thank all uh, the pharmacists who have attended again. Uh, this is one of the many webinars that we plan to have. We believe that this is a very important forum for us to, one, discuss our issues, uh, move forward the agenda of the pharma sector, and, uh, and just keep encouraging each other. I'm going to go quickly to the Q&A. So, panelists, we have... Um, our presenters, we have had a few questions coming in, and uh, I'm just going to read some of the some of the questions here. One is from um, Dr. Sarafina Sikwata, who asks, "In my sub county, I'm currently handling COVID-19 commodities. Do we currently have any guidelines on disposal of used masks?" If so, can they be disseminated? And a similar question to Dr. Anthony again. So that question is to Dr. Anthony uh, Kamau. The second question uh, to him is, uh, don't you think the use, so this is from David Kimonge, don't you think the use of mobility-based methods for estimation of demand is a bit not so accurate, especially given the unpredictability of the number of cases and there's so many assumptions that come with it. Maybe you can tackle those two questions first. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, what I would like to say about uh, disposal of uh, COVID-19 commodities, well, uh, we, we, we use incinerators at the facility so that is why I mentioned public health as part of those that need uh, full PPEs because at every turn they take out their medical waste, uh, which includes PPEs that have been used and immediately, actually within the hour, uh, incinerate the same. Uh, sorry, I'm not aware of any guidelines that uh, have been issued, but if, if I was to advise and input in any guidelines, I would suggest that if an incinerator is available because of potential of uh, infection of these materials, the more they remain wherever they are, should be immediate. Actually, advice within, uh, I believe, half an hour, the item should be incinerated. Then on the second question, whether I think uh, the use of mobility-based methods for estimation of demand is a bit not accurate. I, in my understanding, there are basically three methods of uh, uh, estimation of, uh, or quantification, es estimation of demand. One is a mobility-based method. A second one is a consumption-based method, and that would assume that you already have a, a history of consumption for three months or six months. So basically what you're doing is saying, going forward, then how much do we need? And unfortunately for us, uh, for COVID-19, we, we did not have an estimate of uh, use. Uh, so we couldn't use that method. The third method uh, I'm aware of is what we call the proxy consumption method, where you would look at another facility that has uh, admitted COVID patients and see their medication use or PPE use, for example. In our case, again, we did not have that privilege. 
uh, at the time because we almost started with Magathi at almost about the same time. So then that's why we went for the mobility-based method. All those methods uh, have assumptions. You you have to work with assumptions. I think the the, the, the good thing is that you, you base your assumptions on evidence that helps you minimize um, error. And also the fact that you be constantly, it's not cast in stone, that the, as situations evolve, we keep uh, updating the assumptions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ari, for that. Uh, uh, the next two questions are to Professor Ndemo. Question from Riziki Mulimba. What is the committee doing to make sure that pharmacies' human resource needs are addressed? Uh, that is right ratios at the facilities. Two, from Charles Bosire, what role do you expect community pharmacies to play in the dissemination of important COVID-19 information to the public? Yeah, can I respond to the first question? Yes. Now, actually, when it comes to the um, uh, human resources, the problem we're having, um, we've been trying to address that at the, at the board level. And uh, hopefully it will be, uh, the, my response will be uh, relevant. We, we have uh, this UHC, the Universal Health Coverage, and uh, we're trying to articulate the role of the pharmacists. Apparently, if you don't have any guidelines, you don't have any what you call five star rating for this institution that demand that you need to have uh, specially qualified pharmacists. Oftentimes, all these county hospitals, they don't see the need for a pharmacist. So the only way is, uh, is to up the game on QA, quality assurance in these institutions. So, so that, um, things like all oh, hospitals must have a, a therapeutic, uh, what do you call the pharmacy and three committees with the, of course the pharmacy being a secretary and then you need to have so many clinical pharmacies. So, so really the problem we're having right now is because I believe we have not well articulated the role of the pharmacies. There are no clear job descriptions. And I believe PSK has, uh, has forwarded uh, I remember being part of the recommendations on various job descriptions, depending on, um, uh, so, so there is a lack, there is no clear policy. It's a policy issue really. And uh, so I know that there is lack of pharmacists <clears throat> and of course there is the role of the training institutions, the curriculums need to change. All this thing, the order mutual is a very big topic that uh, really should be fairly be addressed in another day. Thank you for responding to that. I know the, the, the question regarding the community pharmacy role is something that needs to be attended to as well. As uh, PSK, we also intend to bring in pharmacist experiences from the community pharmacies in subsequent webinars. So I'd also just urge members or participants here to look out for uh, calls for webinars again uh, where we're going to have presenters coming from community ph pharmacies to tell us exactly what they're doing, what they have done, and how they are going about uh, uh, wow. responding to COVID-19. Immaculate Nundu has a question to Dr. Kamau. Why a combination, a combination therapy for a mild pneumonia? Why not just the macrolide or amoxiclav alone if it's a mild infection. Second question again from Frederick Givinji. How were you able to navigate the clinician conflict, more so on the use of low cost medicines? Thank you. Um, now, in terms of uh, why the combination therapy, uh, we thought that uh, most of these uh, pneumonias are community acquired or will be community acquired uh, pneumonias. So that is why it is, um, we, are, we are covering both the atypical uh, bacteria with, uh, with the macrolide and then uh, other bacteria that are common uh, uh, pathogens uh, with amoxiclav. 
Then uh, on the other question of um, how we navigated the clinical conflict, more so, well, um, I think it's an ongoing process. We've, we can't say we are, we, are, we are through with it yet, but uh, I think the, the advice that we received and the CEO's response was to engage, to make it almost like a tripartite involving three parties, the research team, the pharmacies, the, the clinicians, so that uh, together we can agree on, on a common way forward. Uh, we fortunately or unfortunately have not had to use hydroxychloroquine because most of our patients are um, uh, mild patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you. There is another question here that can be answered by both. This is from Patrick Kivoto. Have there been studies to support use of multivitamins? And if so, is there a specific vitamin having had speculation on the use of vitamin C? Because there's been quite a lot going on about the use of vitamin C. Second question here is from Mohammed Hanif, Mohammed Hussein. Thanks for the excellent presentation. My concern is how has your regular supply chain been affected by the pandemic? And more so, how is the service delivery of other conditions or diseases at your facility or at your institution. So maybe, Prof, you could uh, say something about vitamin C or multivitamins. The, uh, no, I can, it would be a general comment. You do realize um, when it comes to all the viral infections, the body, of course, has the first line of defense. That is a non-specific defense, of course, with the the macrophages and what have you, et cetera. But of course, immunity plays a very big role. You do realize that the vulnerable patients involved, either the elderly with comorbidities like diabetes, et cetera. So there is, there is this belief, and in fact, there was an article, uh, there's an hypothesis that because of, uh, say, vitamin D, okay, I'm not talking about C now, but vitamin D deficiency in, uh, in other regions like in Europe and in the States, the, there, is, there is actually an, a kind of a, an epidemic. There is a, this quite significant vitamin def, deficiency and a lot of insufficiency. So they, they, they are thinking that in fact, uh, repleting that vitamin D makes a difference in the, on the impact on the immunity. So generally, um, just we have always believed that actually taking a one gram of vitamin C would boost your immunity. It's on, it's on that basis. But whether uh, deliberately taking it and uh, we are able to prevent that require, of course, studies that are well controlled. So there is something about immunity because it's very clear that those who are immunocompromised have an issue. So immunity here is key. And you do realize even nutrition alone, of course, affects immunity. So in, in general, I, I would say it would, there's no harm, there's more to lose, to, I mean, it doesn't hurt you, but um, whether it should be used routinely and by everybody, that I cannot vouch for, I don't know, but it's, it's always good. Me, I take multivitamin myself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Kamau, on um, the, the concern, uh, the concern uh, regular supply chain being affected by the pandemic, and more so, how is the delivery service of other conditions or diseases at your institution? Thank you once more. Um, the regular supply chain has not been uh, adversely affected. And for us, the reason for that mainly is because uh, we were a new hospital starting out. So we had just admitted of uh, probably 100 uh, oncology patients who we still have more or less plus or minus. So other services were temporarily stopped or halted. So which means that uh, clinics uh, may not be going on the way they were going, the, the consultants clinics for specialized for chronic disease and so on and other admissions were also discharged. So 
Uh, typically, our focus has been more on the COVID-19. So, of course, the supplies pertaining to COVID-19 then take center stage. However, if if uh, patients require medicines for or oncology, then those requests keep coming and we keep servicing them as and when required. So it has not affected the, the supply chain as such. Now, for and I probably have answered the, the, the your, your second part of the question, as I answered the first, is that uh, oncology still continues. What we've done is try to uh, segregate the hospital into two sections. Uh, one is a safe section. We, you, if you come to the hospital, you see green markings and red markings where uh, staff who go to isolation wards should pass through. And uh, other staff who go to other areas, maybe the reno for dialysis and so on, should pass through. So there's a, there's a segregation of, of, the, of the areas in the hospital to avoid the cross-infection. However, in overall, we've scaled down on the operations of other conditions. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Uh, we are receiving quite a lot of questions here, and uh, a lot of them are actually directed to Dr. Kamau. So we'll, we'll take a few more questions, but uh, just take note that um, we, our time, we're actually over the time that we plan to have the webinar, but this is quite encouraging because we have had quite an engaging conversation here. Another question from, uh, I'm assuming this is Dr. Yakub Ahmed, what was the rate of adverse drug reactions reported in COVID-19 patients taking hydroxychloroquine in your hospital? Do you screen patients for QTC prolongation? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we have hardly used or actually haven't used hydroxychloroquine as yet because uh, most of our patients up, up to and until last week were mild patients. We've only had one or two uh, ICU admissions before that. Mm -hmm. So we've not really used, uh, most of the treatment has really been supportive treatment. Uh, so I, I may not be able to answer that because we have no, we have no data. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is, you know, just like any other <clears throat> new disease, we keep uh, getting information as they come through. And sometimes we, we need a bit of time to collect all the information so that we can actually provide uh, guidance. And this is no exception for COVID-19. There is Otachi Eric who is asking, do we have any reported cases on masks causing hypercapnia? And I think maybe this is also referring not only to healthcare workers, but as, uh, as uh, patients as well. Dr. Kamau, any? Uh, no, I'm not aware, uh, but definitely if uh, the asker of the question has any such information, we would definitely like to have it. But uh, as far as we are concerned, we've not had any such case. Professor Ndemo, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, I'll pass you this question. This is from Dr. Esther Maina. I think there are several concerns about PPE's quality, especially three-ply surgical masks and sanitizers. What is PSK and PPB doing about this? Yeah, actually, um, our committee, Dr. Mungoma, the moderator, should be able to respond to this. There was that issue um, what was the uh, committee, uh, Dr. Mungoma? What was the committee that was involved? Remember that issue was a public education. It's, I think it's public education, yes. and uh, I honestly, I don't know whether any members of the public education could respond and tell us what stage this issue of uh, quality uh, came up, and uh, I wouldn't uh, say off the cuff of what they have actually done. It definitely the quality was one of the mandates that they, they, they had to meet. They had to make sure that the public gets quality. So I don't know if you, if you know, by any chance you know what they have done. So, yeah, um, I'm, I'm uh, holding two hats here, but uh, I would like to respond a bit. So as a member of the committee, we are doing 
our own background research on masks, not necessarily to just surgical masks, but masks in general, and just trying to get to understand the gaps because there's, there's quite a lot of information as well as misinformation regarding the use of masks as well as the effectiveness of masks. There are those quarters that say they do not really add any value, but there are those quarters again that say they do add value in terms of prevention. Um, I would just maybe direct you to some of the articles that we are sharing out as part of educational materials. I think there's one that is going out, probably went out yesterday, or maybe going out today, that is going to be shared in the PSK newsletter. But again, just to acknowledge the presence of uh, members of KPA, this is something that we have to discuss as a, as a task force to see again how some of these information can be shared with other members of the pharma sector. So <clears throat> PSK is doing its part in terms of gathering information and sharing this information again with uh, members from the MOH uh, team. And just to mention here that uh, some of the members from this task force were also seconded. The names were shared and seconded there because uh, they also asked us to get involved. And um, yeah, these concerns are, again are something that are ongoing. Other concerns regarding these masks include ADRs because certain materials of these masks usually uh, are not compatible to everyone. This is also captured in the article that is going to go out. I think just look out for that article. Um, uh, unfortunately, we do not have any uh, presenter from PPB to respond to this, but that is something that can be considered and definitely will be considered in subsequent webinars. I think this is a particular concern, the use of masks as well as sanitizers. Sanitizers out there, we all aware, even in the media, that there are several bodies out there, including cabs, that are making sure that the sanitizers that go out there actually do what is expected so that um, other people just don't come up and start sharing materials that are purported to be sanitizers. Uh, with that, participants, I think I want to close this webinar. I want to thank everybody who took time to attend this webinar this morning and who actively participated, including uh, providing questions. Once again, I want to thank the two presenters, Dr. Anthony Kamau and Professor Francis Ndemo for taking time to come and share insights and experiences and also just to share, especially Professor Ndemo, uh, regarding the task force and what we are doing as PSK. Those <clears throat> that are having problems accessing um, the portal at P PPB or having uh, problems or, uh, uh, with their CPDs, you can send your details to the email address there on the last slide, which is operations at psk.or.ke. And I'm sure uh, operations manager, that is Dr. Eric, should be able to take care of that. This may not happen today because again, you know, there's a bit of anxiety just to make sure that your points are up, but it will be taken care of. Uh, for those from other cadres, including nurses that uh, I have seen here, just send an email with your details here and we should be able to uh, have a way forward regarding claiming of CPD points. Remember that this webinar is accredited and that you are entitled to CPD points. So once again, uh, it is thank you to uh, everyone who made this happen, including those in the panel, uh, the CEO, uh, Dr. Peter Diambo, who was very good in uh, 
ensuring that the slides moved smoothly despite that technological hitch which is just uh, a spot in the white screen and everyone else who put this together so with that i want to say uh, thank you look out for the next webinars and have a fruitful week goodbye bye goodbye thank you